I'm Nick Kennedy. It's a real uh, privilege to be talking to you guys today. Tough act to follow with uh, Dr. Mayo's great presentation, but we'll switch gears a little bit here. And my presentation is my experience with the quote unquote Mayo way and which aspects are replicable in the private practice setting. So disclosures, obviously these are my opinions, not on behalf of the Mayo Clinic. I have no other relevant disclosures. Um, also, I can appreciate the irony of a fourth year resident trying to explain to all of you who are already in practice some tips and tricks and pearls on how to optimize your own private practice setting. So you'll have to bear with me on that one. So who am I? Just real quick. Uh, I'm a fourth year at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, I was raised in Yakima. I was the oldest of three and probably the bane of my father's existence. Uh, I did most of my schooling in Washington, going to undergrad at the University of Washington before going to Vail, Colorado to do some research and then going to medical school in Portland. I do have one daughter, 18 months old. Uh, she keeps me pretty busy and I got another on the way in May. I am applying to sports fellowship, but do have a particular interest in knee, particularly knee preservation, uh, cartilage work and, and uh, limb alignment. And I plan to return to Yakima to continually bother my father until his retirement date. So just in short, the Mayo Clinic, I'm sure most of you are aware, but the cool history on it is 1883, there was a large tornado which ripped through the town, led to 37 deaths and over 200 wounded. And Mayo Sr. and his two sons cared for the wounded at that point in time. Franciscan sisters saw the good work they did and said that they would raise funding for a new hospital if they would stay on and staff it. And here we are 140 years later, and they have 65,000 employees, over 14 billion annual in revenue, uh, and is widely regarded as one of the best hospitals in the world. So what is the Mayo motto or why do they do so well? Uh, the quote that's kind of plastered all over our hospital is best interest of the patient is the only interest to be considered. And how we accomplish that is kind of through three core shields, they're called. Uh, the three shields are clinical practice, research, and education, and striving to be excellent in each one of those categories. So how is this executed? So again, focusing on putting the patient at the center of all this, kind of a Venn diagram, those three shields always focus on patient first. So in regards to subspecialty driven care, which is kind of the first uh, component of excellence for clinical practice at Mayo, everybody is subspecialized on being subspecialized. I mean, we have orthopedic infectious disease doctors that do multiple fellowships just to, to then provide our antibiotic recommendations on our complex revisions. So in the orthopedic field specifically, a little issue with the clicker here. Advance. Okay. In the orthopedics field, field specifically, we have over 10 different subspecialties. Uh, and this provides obviously adequate and excellent care for our patients who come from all over the world for very complex problems. Now, this talk is about how you can implement some of these strategies in a private practice setting. Obviously, this doesn't exactly equate. Uh, but what you can do is 90 plus percent of residents are now fellowship trained. So the majority of community orthopedics included is going to move towards a specialty based model. So what you have to figure out is what does your community need? Obviously, a Laconer is going to be different than a Spokane, which is going to be different than a downtown Seattle. So finding out what makes the most sense for you. Does it make sense to go specialty based? Does it make sense to go anatomy based more joints wise like a Dr. Mayo having a hip specialist, having a knee specialist, shoulder elbow. So kind of figure out what works for you and then finding a way where the physicians in your practice can focus on a smaller number of surgeries with more volume so that their outcomes can be improved. So another thing to think about Trauma surgeons used to be few and far between, but trauma surgery fellowships have increased in number significantly in the last 10 years. So I do think having a traumatologist in, in a group private practice, if you are associated with a level two or even a busy level three is something to consider. So another thing is obviously team-based medicine. This again, keeps the uh, kind of mantra of stay in your lane and be really good at what you do and then allow others to be good at what they do, right? A bunch of people on the same team focused on a common goal which is the outcome of the patient. At Mayo, we have so many different consults uh, from mind, body, and spirit, including you know sacrament uh, rites during the weekends. Uh, and we truly try and treat the entire patient. So in the private practice setting, again, you can't do that entirely, but you can streamline this. Some of the things that I've seen that work quite well and I could see working in a private practice setting is the five numbered items I have coming up here, which is dietitians, at least associated with the practice would be great, not only for weight loss, for the patients that you need to say, get down below a 35 BMI before you'll do surgery, instead of just telling them, see someone else, 
offer them some, some in, in-house consults, whether it's working with a dietitian, smoking and abuse cessation, possibly psychology, psychiatry, which really has more of a role in your sportsing population, pre-op clearance with your family medicine and, med- and uh, HIM colleagues, and then obviously physical therapy in-house is obviously a huge plus when you have it. And access. So this is the one that is probably the most unrealistic to try and um, put into a private practice version because you guys don't have residents to answer pagers 24 hours a day when a patient calls at one in the morning asking why their thumb hurts after knee surgery. So clearly that can't be exactly uh, replicated, but what can happen is technology can help us bridge this gap. So the rest of the talk kind of focuses on technology and things you can use in your private practice, things like text-based messaging systems. There are multiple companies that are coming out right now. One of them that has good literature supporting it, uh, including a publication in JBGS in 2019 is Streamed. So this is an app that allows you to communicate with your patients with automated text. It also has a chat bot, which will answer, I think, the most common 200 questions you ask after surgery from patients. And it has little flags if, say, they start to say something about a draining wound or DBT symptoms, it'll warn you about that. The outcomes of this were patient, uh, patient outcomes were um, improved as well as patient satisfaction, and it actually decreased the workload of the physician. So moving on, research is the one that I'm really excited about because research was really the private or the academic man's game for a long time, but we have a way to make this more uh, replicable in a private practice setting now. And again, this is based on you know, moving forward to technology. So apps like I spoke about, you could have patients fill out IKDC forms or their VAS scores before they come in, after they come in at certain time points, you could collect data prospectively from a private practice model and actually maybe more efficiently than even some of these bigger hospitals. Other things are in the sporting world, there's new bracing technology that actually allows you to live stream track their range of motion. So say they come for their three month follow-up for their total knee arthroplasty, you'll have the data on how their range of motion has been tracking thanks to that brace they've been wearing. And there's also web-based PT, which does things similar. They can send you report cards. Again, at specific time points, maybe say three months, one year, you get a report card on how your patient's doing. You get thigh circumference, range of motion, as well as functional outcomes. This is good for clinical outcomes, but it's also great for you tracking your own outcomes. Cultivate the culture. So Mayo's culture, it's expected to be involved in research. You explain to the patient why research is a win-win-win. It's a win for the patient because we get to improve our standard of care, which helps their outcomes. It's a win for the physician who wants constant self-improvement, and it's a win for the field of medicine. I have rarely had a patient balk at being involved in research once you explain it. So you make it a standard of care in your practice, you explain it, and some of you may be wondering, why do I care? I haven't done research my entire career. Well, eventually the government will be more involved in our practices, whether we like it or not, and they'll be the ones setting objective and subjective outcome measures of what a patient should look like So instead, we should be involved in the conversation, track our outcomes so that we can have a seat at the table when that day comes. So, and lastly, ensure excellence. Anytime you do research, rigorous IRB and constant self-evaluation is key to implementing good, safe, efficacious research. So education is a little different in the private practice model than Mayo. Again, Mayo has everything you can think of from middle school programs to high school uh, scholarships, all the way up to numerous different fellowships. So it won't look like that in the private practice, but 10 years ago, we had one medical school in the state. Now we've got three with about five different sites. So the ability to be involved as someone who hosts rotating med students and possibly as an adjunct professor is uh, much more uh, available than it was, say, 10 years ago. That's one option. Other things, medical scribes, shadowing, even just guest lecturing at local high schools. You know, you never know who's in that crowd who you may light a fire under and and end up being a colleague one day in our field. Education doesn't stop with those younger either. You obviously want to constantly have a growth mindset in our field and be challenging yourself. So Mayo does this in a multitude of ways, uh, but some that I think are pretty replicable and you could do in a private practice setting uh, include labs, Industry-based labs, cadaver-based labs are not as hard to come by as they used to be. Now you have the mobile labs, like I said, with the five different sites of medical schools in the state. Most of them have cadaver labs associated, including Pacific Northwest and Yakima, which I plan on working with when I come back and I've already had conversations regarding. So there's ways to, you know, endorse uh, some educational opportunities that way. Also, Grand Rounds and Journal Club was always something I never understood why it had to be only at an academic institute. That's a great way to make something collegial, fun, and educational. 
have a journal club at one of your partner's houses with some wine and good, good food, good conversation and some good literature. Grand rounds, maybe have one partner in charge of bringing someone in uh, once a year. Maybe it's a friend from residency or a friend from fellowship in to, to share ideas, uh, share education, and it makes it fun and collegial. And conference attendance is really something that, that should almost be mandatory for members of your practice. You should constantly be looking to self, uh, to improve yourself, to have a growth mindset, and to learn from others in the field. And so lastly, the community, because a lot of us went into medicine, obviously, with the idea to be a leader, not just with our patients, not just with our practice and our colleagues, but also in the community. So Mayo does a phenomenal job at this. And again, they have uh, a lot of zeros. Uh, therefore, they have a little bit more resources than you have. But again, some of the things they do, you can do. So a comprehensive navigatable web page is absolutely mandatory in today's orthopedic world. Because if you think your patients aren't looking you up, you're wrong. They're Googling you. And if they don't have a great website that you've already set up for them to help mold the narrative, they're finding stuff out about you from somewhere else. So that's one thing. Education classes. We do orthoplasty education classes at Mayo. They're phenomenal. They're about hour long to two hour long classes that educate the patient on kind of a what to expect with surgery. Uh, it also helps you to be more efficient in your clinic because then your pre-op appointment can be a little shorter because they already have this hour to two hour long class where they're going to learn everything they could possibly want to know about their upcoming procedure. And then, of course, other things in the community, too. You could think of podcasts, radio shows, videos. Remember, with Dr. Google, everything's a click away. You might as well, again, help mold that narrative and be involved in getting good educational uh, information out there to your patients to help make them educated consumers. So... In conclusion, the things I've learned thus far of my experience at Mayo, always remember the patient is the priority. Create a team-centric environment with shared goals, that being patient outcomes. Incentivize growth. Keep a growth mindset. Constantly challenge yourself to, to self-improve and to know that you haven't reached your ceiling. And make work more enjoyable. Thank you again for your time. I appreciate the opportunity. Awesome. Thank you, Nick. Great presentation. I love your energy. And I uh, thank all the people who are still staying on despite running over. I don't like to run over, but this was well worth it. I'm going to ask to close with uh, your dad, Dr. Tom Kennedy. So your son seems to have a certain level of energy. It makes total sense where this comes from. Are you ready for your son to return to implement all these things? And what are the real life uh, 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 obstacles that you see uh, to your son's vision? Well, uh, his son's vision is part of the reason I'm getting more involved in what's going on in town. Um, and just the importance of, of it, it's pointed out the importance of me to me that we really need to mold what happens uh, and not leave it up to hospital administrators and, and other people that really don't uh, in fact, they don't even care about patient care much anymore. They're so busy looking at the bottom line. Um, and Alan co commented about how Providence was mismanaged. I did, I did kind of glance over it, but uh, it was, they put, they put healthcare of the patient so far in arrears um, when they cut the number of staff. I mean, the, there were bad things happening all over the place. Uh, and uh, with a CEO who's, I think, more interested in, in um, making his own pocketbook get bigger, um, it really did just destroy a, a completely uh, once capable hospital that was outstanding for many years. So, you know, I think it's just really important for all of us to have uh, the energy to mold what's going on because, gee, many Christmas. If we don't, nobody else is going to do it for us. To say it any better, Tom uh, and Nick and Dr. Mayo, we thank you very much for your great and intriguing presentations. By us taking care of patients, hopefully we can resume uh, getting a priority uh, position in patient care and a strong advocacy role for our patients. That's what my take home message is, whether it's doing complex hip surgeries and getting appropriate appreciation and support for it, whether it's getting the programs as Nick elucidated, whether it's actually buying a hospital out from major health plans. And with that taking a singular driving role as an orthopedic surgeon and funders in shaping the healthcare in your region. Those are all very inspiring stories. Thank you all for joining us. Look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you, Kennedy. Thank you.